that's um, that articulation of teaching is celebrating the Dhamma just rings so true, you know, and I think, um, yeah, the, the draw to do it as, you know, framed as such, I think really is a, there's a ring of truth to that. Um, and I'm curious, I, uh, the, well, I have three questions. Um, so take, take which one you want, but, um, you know, one is, what kept you going through all these years? Like what's drawn you through the life, through all the disillusionments? I know Long Parpasana says stubbornness is quite helpful. And I know I have some of that in me, um, but I don't know for you, what's been the thread that you followed. And um, the other is where you see these next years going for you, what what your interest is or your trajectories open up, um, opening up. And then the third is just not, there's not room for that. So I'll just leave it at two for now. And, <laughs> Tag that on after. <laughs> so. That's great because my memory's not brilliant. So, <laughs> yeah, what qualities have seen me through? Um, yeah, actually, Venerable, stubbornness definitely is one that I share there with you. Um, seriously, though, um, there were times um, in my life as a sealer draw when stubbornness was the the quality that really kept me in place. Um, and I'm grateful for that in retrospect because uh, there were times when there was a lot of confusion and it was probably better to do nothing just to sort of keep plodding on. Um, who knows, but that's, that's the sense I have. Um, the most important quality though, seriously for me was uh, just understanding that um, you know, there is suffering and there's really just um, nothing more compelling than the wish to be free from suffering. And, you know, my whole life, actually, adult life has been revolving around this uh, issue <laughs> because, you know, actually, since I was very young, sort of five or six, I um, had a... a I had an experience when I was very small where it occurred to me um, that uh, everybody I loved was going to die and so was I. And um, I can remember actually the very moment that this occurred to me, I was sitting at our dining room table in my parents' home where we lived in Cyprus and listening to a song on the radio which was called seasons in the sun and it's actually about somebody who's dying uh, at least that's what i understood i'm pretty sure that's what it's about and i love this song i liked the tune so i listened to the words and as i was listening to the words it dawned on me um that this is the this is what's going to happen to everyone i know and myself we're all going to die and it had an enormous impact on my mind um, it was a bit like a bomb going off. Everything kind of rearranged itself and all my simple pleasures sort of fell away. And I went into a kind of a depression for quite some time. I really don't know how long, but it seemed like a very long time when I was that, that age. And uh, I was seeking um, from that time on to find a way to kind of meet that suffering, meet that suffering, which for me was fear and great distress, a sense of futility. Uh, what could I do? How could I uh, work with this? What, what am I supposed to do? And so my quest became one of um, trying to alleviate suffering. And I, I could only see one way um, of doing that, and that was through work in the world, you know, and so I wanted to be some kind of a carer. And actually, I wanted to be a doctor from that time. I decided <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. And I, I, my sense is actually clearly now that it was a, it was a very long-standing wish. It was something very karmically powerful for me that I had to do this thing. And anyway, so I did become a doctor. And I was, you know, seeking, uh, striving to 
um, alleviate suffering and getting quite disillusioned. Uh, and then I came across the Buddhist teachings. Actually, when I was in India, I was at Sarnath, uh, not knowing anything about the Buddha or that it was a Buddhist site. I was just traveling around India and I ended up at Sarnath in my early 20s and somebody gave me a book on Buddhism out of the blue. Uh, this man just came and gave me this book uh, on the teachings of the Buddha and I started reading it and yeah, it was like the penny dropped. It's like, yes, maybe there's a, a more kind of uh, effective way of dealing with suffering. Maybe suffering is not so much disease and sickness, but it's something deeper, deeper than that. And it took me back to my the conundrum of my childhood, um, this, this terrible situation that we find ourselves in uh, of being mortal beings. And uh, from that time, really, um, I had this very clear sense of direction. And so the meditation then was uh, very important to me. And then the chance of living as a monastic, of actually living the holy life and dedicating all my time and energy to the practice was a part of this. And it's so for me, the direction has been very clear, like throughout. <laughs> my life it was just a matter of finding the right vehicle and the vehicles kind of presented themselves at different stages and but the the journey the quest or the work has been exactly that of you know seeing suffering and feeling compelled to find the way out of suffering and of course it takes us to the you know the roots of suffering uh, in this heart and mind, and then the work of slowly but surely eradicating those roots. And, you know, I just feel extremely blessed to have, to have this kind of <laughs> quality of obsession, really, <laughs> uh, you know, and to then have found really, um, I'm quite, contented and very sure of the answer to my question uh, what is the way out of suffering well we have the answer we know how to um, face suffering when we have the way out of suffering and the work then just needs to be done thank you yeah i have one of the other modes of your monastic life which we haven't really gone into which i think uh is a good synthesis of like your urge to um, to help other people, your your medic urge or your uh, healing um, inclination, and your monastic life, your inclination inwards, is actually your time in Ajahn Ganha's. I've only spent a very limited time there, but one of his, you know, favorite teachings, as I've heard them, is just Siasala, Siasala, which is the Thai word, which is often translated as sacrifice. It's just. You know, he's teaching the monks and the lay people again and again, just sacrifice. What is the path? What is the goal? It's sacrifice. It's sacrifice. And I've heard, you know, people suggest that maybe selfless service is a better translation. But I'm curious about your relationship with that teaching, with your time at Ajahn Ganha's, um, because that's not what a lot of certainly Westerners think about when they think about monastic life. They think it's like, it's not selfless service. Like, I'm, I'm serving me. You know, I'm going to get out of the samsara. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh Basically, I'm curious how you were able to um, take those teachings on and, and uh, what use you found with them. Thank you so much, Ajahn, for that question, because it's really uh, wonderful to be able to speak about Lumpur Ganha, um, who has had a tremendous influence on me. I, um, yeah, I met him quite a few years ago and had limited time at his monastery and then just kept coming back more and uh, <clears throat> so it was quite natural for me when I took time out from the Amravati community to go make a beeline back to what's of Tui and uh, really uh, practice with his guidance and his teachings and just allow them to kind of percolate through 
And indeed, his teaching is very simple. Uh, he doesn't uh, <laughs> he doesn't uh, vary his teaching. He's uh, consistently um, and clearly telling uh, his disciples um, to let go of selfishness, to yep, serve selflessly, to sacrifice the self. <laughs> And uh, all self, all self-interest needs to go. And he points out, you know, very clearly and obviously that when we let go of self-interest, we can start to feel a little bit happier. <laughs> and uh, you know, our life becomes more simple and more clear. And of course, the Thai um, practitioners all around him are very um, kind of conversant with this this way of teaching. Um, it seems to be very natural for them to fully take it on board. And so living at Wat Subtui is quite um, a privilege uh, as an experience, as a place of practice. It's very beautiful because people are um, really striving to serve the community and to let go of their selfish uh, wishes and desires. And so it's a very inspiring, uplifting place to be. And for, for me, as a Westerner, I, f I, I felt I needed to really kind of immerse myself in this way of practice to fully understand it, because we are taught um, kind of differently. Um, you know, the kind of individualism and self-determination <laughs> Uh, the sense we have of autonomy, of agency, my life, you know, my needs. Uh, it's good for us to express our needs, to know what we need and to be able to express that and get what we need and so forth. And I'm not really saying any of that is wrong. It's just this is a cultural um, way of relating to life that can cause a lot of suffering for us. Um, and, you know, the Buddha's teaching on basic teaching on, you know, dana, sila, bhavana, um, you know, generosity uh, comes first, and then virtuous living, virtuous speech, virtuous action, virtuous thoughts, and then, you know, practice. This kind of sequence um, really, for me, became very apparent uh, when I was practicing there in Thailand at Wat Sub Tui uh, with Lung Po Ganha. Um, very clearly, you know, one can see that the more we let go in terms of giving, you know, this kind of quality of chaga or, or just giving it away, giving giving our energy out, giving it away, um, giving all that we can give, um, all that is not given is lost, you know, um, recognizing that, recognizing that it's in giving that we... Uh, can really let go of our suffering. Um, this first step uh, for me really became so clear, so apparent. And, and fr this is the place from which the sila, the, the virtue flows quite naturally. And then the practice is possible. Uh, we can live with ourselves. <laughs> we can sit with ourselves. We can relax here. And I needed to learn that, Venerables, because I, I was actually quite, um, yeah, you know, I, I feel that uh, I hadn't picked that up. I hadn't picked up somehow. I, I could have done, but I didn't pick up um, the, the importance of dana, the importance of giving, the importance of self-sacrifice um, until I uh, landed at Watsub Tui and spent more time there. And it's like a, it's like one of those you know, missing pieces of the jigsaw or something. I, I so needed to develop that quality. And uh, so I can I can say that, uh, yeah, Lung Po's teaching is very consistently this kind of encouragement to both to give and to let go, you know, kind of they come together and to notice, recognize the benefit, the effect of selfless service or sacrifice, this beautiful Thai word, siasala. Thank, Thank you, Ayan. Do you have uh, one story of Longpur Ganha you can give us? And, 
And then just, I'm curious about any, uh, what you see, where the brightness leads you these next years that you see. Thank you, Venerable. Mm. A story of Lung Pogan Ha. Mm. Uh, I can only share with you my, you know, what immediately comes to mind, which is the way that he would, um, you know, demonstrate his teaching consistently and um, beautifully, you know, on a daily basis. And uh, so, you know, he, he, he's open to, you know, receiving uh, visitors um, morning, noon and night. And uh, he, he will uh, have, you know, beside him all the different offerings that people bring in. Um, and he, he receives, you know, all the various uh, gifts. Uh, and then he, <laughs> he, he throws them out to whoever happens to be present. So the sense of going to see him, it's a bit like going to a kind of party <laughs> where uh, a, a sense of celebration is going on um, because he's, he's gleefully uh, kind of sharing whatever he's offered um, in such a, a way. Um, <laughs> he has a, a big bowl of, uh, or a, a kind of wooden basin um, full of boiled sweets uh, and chews, little kiddies, candies uh, beside him at all times. And often his hand will be resting on these sweets, these treats, and he throws them at people. Um, it's just very beautiful. For me, it's, it's, it's both fun and it's a very profound teaching that's going on. Um, and it's a call to joy, you know, just recognizing this is a path of joy, actually. It really is. And then Lung Po Gan Ha would get in his car um, after his sessions with people coming to see him at his kuti um, and he'd be driving around the monastery and have a whole load of treats and goodies uh, in his lap and he would just you know stop the car uh, whenever he sees somebody and he'll be handing out <laughs> handing out presents gifts uh, offerings and uh, so for me this is a very lovely a lovely memory of he also is extremely busy um, with all sorts of projects, um, building hospitals, building schools, expanding the monastery, the whole infrastructure of the monastery um, and all the work that's constantly being done to maintain the monastery. He's, he has the overview of all of this. He's uh, kind of multitasking. Uh, on a daily basis and now he's I think 71 or 72 I think he's 72 now um, he's easing up a little bit but the extraordinary energy is very apparent and he has a a quality that um, I found very uh, healing and helping on the path which is that he's consistently reliably, um, calm, peaceful, happy, and benevolent. And that's really something. And uh, just to see the results of the practice, to see the, uh, you know, the way that we can become uh, such a blessing to the world, you know, such a bright light in the world. It's very, very inspiring to be in the presence of such a person. So, uh, yeah. Um, for myself, uh, the trajectory, the future, I have no idea. Uh, and I like it that way. Um, it feels very good <laughs> to not really know what's happening in the future. I feel seriously that the future is very uncertain for, for us all. It always has been, it always will be, but um, it feels particularly at this time um, of great change and great upheaval for so many people globally. I feel that, um, you know, we're all standing on shifting sands and uh, I'm sure people have probably always felt that way, but it feels very powerfully so at this time with climate change and, 
yeah, a, a, a sense of uh, approaching a cliff edge um, as a species, um, not just for our species, in fact, isn't it? But there's a sense of great change afoot and uncertainty, and the future <laughs> is always uncertain, but I feel um, very, very in tune with that sense of who knows. Um, what I actually do just uh, practically speaking is um, I generally will, if invited to serve in any way, in any place, I'll say yes, unless I've got something else that's already happening. So my intention's just simply to um, to share our Dharma and to be of benefit where and how I can. Like not like I'm, you know, but just in a humble way, just whatever can be useful. And I'm really, I guess, motivated as a bhikkhuni to serve the bhikkhuni sangha and support the bhikkhuni sangha because it's a sort of quite, um, in some ways, challenging for bhikkhunis. And uh, anything that we can do to support and help each other, I really celebrate that. And so I'm noticing that the way it's going for me is that I'm basically offering and trying to support bhikkhunis wherever I can. Thank you. Ajahn Kobil and I have both been at those long poor ganha morning food throws. And sometimes you have to be pretty on your feet to keep the stray banana from getting you <laughs> so. an eye out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got to be able to catch well. He's a good thrower, isn't he? <laughs> Yeah, you can like throw two or three at a time, and somehow it's like some kind of ninja. ninja and, and he gets the monks, the monastics, numerous times. Probin P set. That's right. Yeah. Aya, right. yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us, for sharing your, your wisdom. We're so glad you're smoking out the sheds, and it's, it's a boon for the Bhikkhuni Sangha, and uh, that you're going around and living with with different communities in that respect and have that intention going forward. And uh, it's a boon for all of us. You talked about the golden age of, uh, of Buddhism, you know, that, you know, the teachings from so many different uh, great teachers can be accessible. And um, we're certainly grateful as are, uh, we've heard from many of the people up in Seattle uh, who are also listening to your talks that uh, it's much appreciated and yeah, having beautiful voices and, you know, singing the, you know, uh, speaking the Dhamma is just a, a wonderful thing. So thank you for taking the time and we'll end the stream, but maybe we can, Tanisbo and I can stick around with you for uh, a little bit afterwards too. So thank you, Aya. Thank you so much, Venables. Yeah. And thank you also for your great support of the community up there in Seattle area and the beautiful work of Clear Mountain, which I'm really celebrating and enjoying your talks and teachings so much and benefiting from them so much myself. Thank you. Thank you, Aya.